Hey, Manufacturing World, welcome to another episode of Shop Matters, sponsored by Akuma America. I'm your host for today's episode, Wade Anderson. Today I'm excited. I've got uh, a good friend of mine from Shunk USA here with me, Michael Gantz. Michael is the Vice President of Sales for Shunk USA, so welcome, Michael. Yeah, thanks. I'm happy to be here, Wade. Good to see you. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, How long have you been with Shunk? What did you do before that? Um, How did you get involved in in this crazy industry that we live in? Yeah. uh, So like you said, I'm the VP of Sales at Shunk uh, for Shunk USA. I've been at Shunk for eight years. And it's kind of a funny and serendipitous story in many ways, uh, how I came into manufacturing. I, I feel I was just chatting with this uh, about this with my colleague in uh, Chicago last week. And manufacturing is a really interesting industry, and I've loved to be in this industry. It's, it's um, done very well by me, and it's really interesting. Uh, actually, so before I was at Shunk, I was at a company called Doc Magnet, and we were designing specialty magnetic work holding and magnetic lifting. Okay. Well, prior to that, I was actually just, I was at NC State, so NC State University, a little ways down the road from here, and I was studying physics, um, and that's what I got my degree in was I got a BS in physics, and I graduated in 2012, and the funny thing was is that about a year before I graduated, my old soccer coach called me, and he asked if I wanted to interview for a design engineering position with him. And he was, it was his own, he was the owner of the company and he just was looking for a designer to help kind of carry on his legacy. And it was him and his son doing halftime accounting and also another uh, technician designer uh, who was doing the controls and also helping to design and build the magnets that we were designing. And so he called me and asked if I wanted to interview for to be a designer with him. And I said, yeah, sure. I, I honestly, I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, yeah. when I left college, I, I, I was actually looking into possibly like traveling the world. And, uh, I don't know, there was this <laughs> thing called woof woofing or something like that, where you could go work on farms around the world. Like I said, I, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Um, and he, he called me asking if I wanted to interview to be a designer and I did. And I came by and, and that got me into it before I knew it. I was working, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. with him, um, and then I was going to school, and then I'd come back and work 2 p.m. to 5 p.m., and he needed the help, obviously. Business was growing quickly, and so I was designing uh, special electro-permanent magnetic work holding systems with him, and uh, I, I, I owe a lot to him. His name was Simon Barton, actually, and uh, he taught me everything I knew and really gave me a start in the industry. Um, so while I was working there, he was, he was teaching me about designing special electro permanent magnetic work holding and, uh, about a year actually. So a year after being, being full time and after I graduated, he had a stroke in about 2013, late 2013. And by that time we'd actually grown from three people to eight people in a really short period of time, and the business was bootstrapped. And we tried to keep the business running as long as we could, um, but with him mostly out of commission at that point, uh, it, it was tough. So we, we ended up closing the doors in 2015, and that's how I ended up at Shunk. But okay. in that time, trying to keep a, a family business running, and um, I, I was thrown into the deep end as well because I was just trying to keep – uh, orders coming in and, and we were designing and building special systems at Doc Magnet. And I remember just going out to Houston and getting thrown in with the sharks, trying to figure out how to swim and, um, you know, calling on oil and gas industry, working with distribution, trying to just bring in business and, uh, and then figuring out how to pay the employees every two weeks. So once that closed, I ended up at Shunk. Long story uh, for your short question, but um, ended up at Shunk as a sales engineer and then kind of came up okay. through the technical uh, roles at Shunk. That's, uh, that reminds me of the old, there's an old story about a tree that grows with no wind, doesn't have any roots. Um, so uh, it's actually a very weak tree once it grows to full size. Um, but trees that experience storms and hard winds and things of that nature develop really big, strong roots. So some of what you went through sounds like kind of set the roots for what you're doing today in an executive world. 
It really did. I, I think, you know, and that's actually something I look for a lot when even hiring people too, is that it, coming from small businesses, it, it, it teaches you a lot about ownership and, and seeing the bigger perspective. It's not just about the one role that you're doing here. It's, it's seeing how it all connects to ultimately um, lead to the bigger picture for the business. And a lot of people right. coming from small businesses, they've seen that and, and it helps them to uh, fulfill their more role successfully. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Jim King, our president, he, uh, he kind of helped me with that years ago. I was a regional sales manager at the time and uh, he pulled me in, wanted me to take over tech centers, a couple of other different roles. And that was one of the things he told me. He said, you know, you, you are really focused on you and, and your territory and what you're doing for yourself and your family. I need you to pull back and look at things from a broader perspective and look at what you do and how it affects the entire organization. That was a whole different perspective for me at the time. So, Yeah, it's really important. I, I, I Like I said, when hiring people and I, I actually, I find myself now, I don't know if it was this new title I got or something, but I find myself giving more unsolicited advice and <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's horrible, honestly. I'll just, but you know, I, I see these, I see the younger generation coming in and we have a, an apprentice program at Shunk in North Carolina. And I always just want to take the opportunity to talk with them about what they want to do and, and help kind of, uh, guide them just to ask them questions and about, you know, what they want to do and where they want to go. Cause a lot of times they just don't know. And one of the, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I, I, I give to the, um, to these people coming through and just really early on in their career, as I said, the best thing you can do is don't wait to be told what to do at an organization. Now, granted, you know, the organization is going to require certain things from you, so don't just go rogue, right? But don't wait to be told what to do. Figure out how your skills bring the organization value and try and do those things that bring the organization value. Figure out how you bring the organization value. Yeah. And that's on you. It's not, don't, don't wait for the organization to ask you to do something explicitly. Right. Yep. I had a gentleman, I used to work for another company. Um, I was an application engineer, um, fairly strong AE, um, was really good at what I did. And uh, he pulled me outside one day and he said, you know, you're the best sales guy that we've got and you're not in sales, you're an AE. And he said, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but you should be on the other side of, of what I'm doing. Uh, it was a guy named Jack Conley. He was one of the, the best sales guys. Um, it was the best sales guy for that company, probably one of the best ones I've ever met. And, uh, so he was the one that kind of gave me the nudge to say, Hey, why don't you think about doing something other than what you're doing currently? i never thought about it before that. And now I look back and, you know, all my years at Akuma, I've had like eight different job titles and done all sorts of different things. Um, not all of it sales related or, or outside sales exactly. Uh, but a lot of everything I've done has been sales related in how it affects the overall good of the company. And there's so many more careers out there than what I think people realize. So I think you spending time talking to, to younger people, especially in the apprenticeship programs and things, very important because, you know, there's times you kind of, you're used to what you're exposed to and you get the, the blinders on. You think this is the only path I've got where if you can take a, a broader look, there's a lot of different paths in this, this manufacturing world we live in. No, it's true. I, and you don't always see that. Yeah. Until you just get in and try things out. Right. Um, I, I recognize that that was one of the things that I was missing. I think that's why when I was getting ready to graduate that I didn't know what I wanted to do is because I didn't get out there and try things. And uh, so it's great. I love when I can see people who just automatic who are already here, they're already trying things. And, and you want to embrace that and make sure that they're going to um, continue to stay there and try things out because that's how you figure out what you want to do because there's so many things it's hard to explain what the possibilities are as an application engineer or designer right. or, or uh, even working in sales in this industry mm -hmm. um, it's hard to see those things or to describe them to someone and have them know oh that's what I want to do it's you kind of need to experience it yeah it's really interesting though I didn't know you came from the application engineering side. Yeah. Um, long, long story, but I started out uh, actually programming uh, Salvanini shear press and brake system. Uh, moved to Charleston, South Carolina, a whole other long story, but went to work for a company called Wholeset Turbo. Uh, I was part of Cummins back then, and uh, that was the first chip that I ever cut. It was actually on the Kuma lathe, uh, an old LB15 that they had. 
Um, so went from there to another little job shop and, and then I went to work for another, uh, OEM company prior to Akuma. And, um, so that's kind of where I got involved in the machine tool side of things and, um, never thought this is where I would be, you know, when I first started out, um, very much to what you're saying. When I was in high school, I'd never dreamt that I'd wind up being a machinist someday. Just wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't in my, my line of vision. Now you fast forward, and um, I can't imagine doing anything differently. So same here. I, yeah. I I think about that a lot. I I could have never imagined myself here. Right. I, I even I I made a when I made a brief speech at my rehearsal dinner at, at, for my wedding. I I said uh, I I haven't really planned exactly so much of what I want to do, and I'm always impressed by people who do know exactly what they want to do and it always but it feels like it's just a series of choices that you make along the way so along the way make sure you make the right choice because that's what leads you to where you are today and that's how I feel is I just I'm here and it's the perfect thing for me right now and I love what I do and I love the industry and I love the people in the industry but I could have never predicted I would have been here yeah isn't that something yeah yeah, it really is so our conversation kind of went down a whole different (laughs) path than what I actually brought you in for so but it's a lot of fun. Though. That's that's part of what I enjoy doing uh, doing these things for. So, um, tell me a little bit about Shunk. Uh, you know, anybody listening, uh, tell us about Shunk as a company, and then just some of the newer technologies that you guys are involved in at the moment. Yeah, Shunk. We're a family owned company uh, first and foremost. I'm I'm very proud of that. I I'm very close with um, many of the executives and management team, Mister and Miss Shunk. Uh, uh, back home in, in Germany. Um, so we're a family owned Germany company, uh, and we're primarily a component manufacturer and the components that we produce are primarily for the manufacturing industry, uh, metalworking industry to, to be exact. Our first product was Chuck Jaws for lathe chucks okay. actually. So Mr. Heinz Dieter Schunk, um, about 75 years ago, what they were they started as a a job shop making parts for you know automotive parts for Porsche okay. and his first standard product line to be produced was lathe chuck jaws mm-hmm. and from there uh, lathe chucks two holders um end of arm grippers and so on so like i said we're a component supplier component manufacturer and where we fit is on the machine table between the machine table and the spindle so two holders in the spittle spin, <laughs> spindle and uh work holding devices on the machine table okay. and then uh robot flange so components to go on the end of the arm of a robot okay. and on the automation side we've also you know we've expanded that portfolio to be many other components inc- including linear motion rotary motion and so on um, but I'm focused on the metalworking side. Uh, that's kind of been my background, as I mentioned, with the uh, electro permanent magnetic work holding devices. So, work holding and tool holding is where I'm focused on for the metalworking industry. So, being you got such a deep history on magnetic work holding, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what are some of the applications? Uh, we currently just installed one on an MB80V that we've got on the floor. Um, we were doing some testing for some of the IMTS work we're doing which will be another topic here in a minute. But um, tell me about magnetic work holding and where's the, where's the sweet spot for using that type of component? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because that's one of the most important things to be able to distinguish because magnetic work holding can sometimes be a black box or mysterious. But uh, magnets, just like any work holding device, have their place. And, and if you know that place they can be really, really good. Uh, they're great for achieving flat and parallelism. First of all, it can't be aluminum. It has to be some sort of ferrous material. Ferrous material, yeah. right. So um, actually, when I first started at Shunk, one of my first applications was on an Akuma Millac. Uh, I think the table was maybe 40 by 80 or something like that. Okay, um, yep. A larger table. Right. And we put four magnets on this table, and what they were doing was uh, steel plates. The steel plates were about 10 inches by 24 inches or so. And uh, the reason they were using magnets, they actually wanted to achieve really high uh, material removal rates, and they were having some problems with chatter. Hmm. Because if you think about it, to hold steel plates, uh, 
especially larger steel plates, there's only so many ways you can do it. You can have some edge clamps or some toe clamps, or maybe you can bolt it straight down to the table. But all of those, they're still only making point contact or uh, you're having to move them, move them around um, to, to be able to access the whole workpiece. Um, and with magnets, you have complete access to the, the entire surface without moving anything around. And it gives really good vibration reduction um, uh, qualities. Okay. But to kind of take a step back and just bring that together again, um, where do magnets fit? Large steel plates are great. Um, the rule of thumb I like to give is that if it's eight and a half by 11 in terms of area and contact with the magnet, you're going to have enough force uh, to do whatever kind of machining you need um, comparative to a traditional type of work holding. Okay. A vice or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Right. So magnets have really good vibration reduction qualities, and they're also great for achieving flat and parallel because you're going right down on the table and you're making sure you're pulling it down in the Z. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was working with a pr these apprentices one time trying to get this plate parallel yeah. and they were clamping it with a vise and it was uh, three quarters of an inch thick. And as soon as you start clamping it, you're introducing a little bit of bending stress. Mm -hmm. Well, the nice thing about a magnet is you're just pulling it down and so for sure you're going to get really good parallelism. Now, flatness magnets can also deal with um, by having self-shimming or self-leveling poles. Okay. Uh, so they're not distorting the workpiece. So I was wondering it. about that. How flat does the workpiece need to be to start with before you uh, are able to utilize the magnet? Yeah, so one, let's, let's say you need to machine a plate uh, flat and parallel with an thousandths of an inch or something like that, two thousandths of an inch. Um, when you're starting with rough plate, uh, the top tooling that goes on top of the magnet, they make um, self-leveling poles that can move up and down to the workpiece. And what you do is you use three fixed poles and then the rest are self-leveling. So you establish your plane off the three and then let everything adjust up to it. Exactly. And so when you clamp on that first operation, you're not distorting the workpiece at all. You're clamping it in its natural position. Um, you know, free state machining, essentially. So right. on your first operation, you can get really good flatness. And the only stresses that are you're going to see are the stresses that are inherent in the material and then what you introduce when you're cutting. Okay. But there's no work holding stresses. Uh, so now you have really good flatness, flip it over, and then don't use the self-leveling poles, suck it straight down to the magnet, um, and then you get really good parallelism. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the good. cool thing is with a magnet, too, is you can also you can clean the top surface. You know, one of the first things you do when you can install a magnet on your machine table is you, duff, you dust the, the surface of the magnet, and you know now that it's exactly parallel to your... To the machine. Yeah. Right. So you're making it square to the world, basically, at that point. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What um, what all does it take to actually install it to the machine? Is there any tie-in to the control itself? Or are you able to, to wire up off of a separate drop? Yeah. What a lot of people will do is you can, you can wire into the drop for the machine. You can actually tie into the power of the machine, provided it's 480. Um, you just have a a separate breaker there um, or you can have a drop to the control unit um, separately but what you need is 480 volts um, and it's a single phase that goes to the control unit in terms of the install on the magnet of the magnet on the machine the magnet just bolts to the machine table and the nice thing about uh, milling magnets the electro permanent ones which is mostly what you see out there is electro permanent what that means is that there's permanent magnets inside of the the assembly the the magnetic table and all you're doing with the power is just a switch from on to off um, so the nice thing is you don't have any power in the machine you're just you install the control unit outside of the machine the magnet on the table and then when you want to energize the magnet you plug in the plug from the control unit into the magnet, power it on, remove the plug, and you're good. Okay. So it's actually quite simple. As long as you have 480 volts, it's, it's an easy installation. Right. Does chip contamination, does that become an issue? 
It's something you always have to think about. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, once you get, once you're familiar with it and as long as the material, you know, if you're using it in an ideal scenario, like we said, with large plates, um, that are half inch thick or thicker, you don't see any problems with chips. The, the places where chips come in is, um, if you have uh, a really thin plate, it means there's not enough material there to absorb all the magnetism. Mm. So what happens is you now have this stray magnetism and it starts accumulating extra chips and stuff like that. But if you have three quarters of an inch thick plate, you're not when you're milling that top surface, you don't see any chips getting stuck. Okay. Um, what about contours? Can can a magnet? Can you basically mill a shape into that magnet to hold a contoured part? Yeah, you certainly can. Uh, so w- w- one way to do that is you can you can buy or produce um, top plates for the magnet is what we call them, and basically they're kind of they're either sacrificial or they're permanent. However, you end up using it, but uh, it's nothing more than a mild steel plate with just some uh, slots cut in it to kind of separate the poles of the magnet. Um, but you can mill contours into these plates and for whatever shape you need. It's actually a, uh, you can create, I've done that a lot actually, is you can create special fixtures with these top plates with locating features on there or or you can even cut out holes or something if you need to do some through work on the, on the part. Okay. Um, so it's a great way to design specialized fixtures with magnetic technology. Yeah, excellent. What other uh, what other new technologies or new work holding products does Shunk have that you're excited to show? Are you guys de- debuting anything new at IMTS this year? Yeah, we've uh, there's a few things I'm excited about. Number one, obviously, five axis um, is basically the new norm. Right. Um, it, it was funny. I was at a shop just last week, and and he's saying it, even if it's not continuous five axis work and it's kind of more like three plus two work where you're just needing to access all five sides he's like as soon as i see holes in all five faces it's like i quote it with five axis because he knows it's one setup um essentially it's two but um so five axis is really big um and we have a new five axis vice that's really cool um it's called a ksx c2 um but essentially what it is is uh it has um, the the jaws are actually uh, raised up quite high, and they're they have angles um, on them to allow really good clearance to the workpiece. But what's really cool about this five axis vice is that you can you can move both jaws actually, and then you fix them wherever you want to. So the way it works is you can move a fixed jaw, you can move the fixed jaw, and then lock it in place where you want. So it's a fixed jaw vice, um, but you can move the fixed jaw so that it positions the workpiece where you want it in the machine for ideal access. Okay. You move the fixed jaw, lock it in place, and then it has two ways of functioning. Uh, the first is that you actuate it like a standard vise, and the moving jaw just comes in and clamps. But the second is what's really cool is you can actually lock the, the moving jaw in place where you want, and what it does is it changes the function of the vise so that now it, when you clamp, both of the main base jaws are locked, and when you clamp, it transitions to a, a different clamping mechanism, and only the top jaw moves. And when the top jaw moves, it has a pull-down effect. So especially for the second operation, it's what this vice is great for, is that it's actually pulling the workpiece down so that you know the Z is exactly set. Because especially in the second operation with precision five-axis uh, work, it's important that you have it pulled down to a stop. And so this vice, it's basically universal five axis vice. It's great for first operation, great for second operation. Okay. Now, is it only manual or can you uh, air or hydraulically actuate it? It's a good question, actually. It, it, they actually developed it in such a way that you can convert the spindle to be a hydraulic uh, spindle if you want as well. Huh. Um, but primarily it's sold as a manual vice, as a universal vice for five axis machining. Yeah. Um, and, um, the, we, we also have a completely separate line of pneumatic and hydraulic vices. This vice in particular is 
mostly uses a manual. The, I was asking one of our machinists in our shop how he liked the vice because that's a great test bed. I always walk out to our yeah. shop to ask the that's machinists gauge, what they right? think. Yeah. Yep. Um, I won't. I won't tell you about the times when I go and ask them what they think about a new product, and they're like, "Ah, I don't like it." I said, "Oh, <laughs> tell me why." <laughs> right. Yeah. Especially in your role. Right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this vice, I was talking to one of our machinists, and and he said one of his favorite things about it was the clearances that it has, because he he said, "Yeah, I was just machining this part, and I was able to use a really short, stubby tool holder and get right up on the face." And he wasn't having to use extended gauge length tool holders or extended tooling to get right up on the face of the vise behind the jaws. Yeah. So even those clearances, all of those little things that make a big difference. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Especially on five axis, there's so many areas where um, the, the gotchas, right? The, the clearances and swinging into a clamp that you didn't realize was there on a piece of work holding, things like that. It's so crucial and uh, it's where it's tools like Veracut and people like that. It's so important. We have a product called 3D VM, uh, but it gives you a chance to visualize what what your path looks like uh, going around the part. And it's that's where so much of the upfront work to be successful in what's coming out at the finished product depends on how good you're doing upfront work. Um, utilizing all these tools to streamline that process, uh, keep that spindle operating, right? So you know when it hits the floor, you're good. You're going to have the clearances you need and, and you can start making chips quicker. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's those little things that go a long way too. It just reminded me, you, know, you mentioned what products I'm excited about it. We, along the same lines, we just launched a new Chuck, uh, the THW3. It's our quick jaw change Chuck, but it, it's the little things. This Chuck actually has chamfers on the OD uh, between the three jaws and that was, once again, you know, I'm talking to a machinist about this chuck. And uh, he's like, oh, that's what I really like is those chamfers. It's giving me better access when I come in with a live tooling to machine maybe a, a hole or drill and tap a hole on the OD of a, a part on a lathe. And it's those little things. So that THW3 chuck, it's, it, it's thinking about all those things and hearing the feedback from the machinists, from the people who are using the products and integrating those into... Uh, the products, um, you have to have that iteration right. because it's it's about the people who are using your products and those those uh, those features go a long way even though sometimes they seem to be small things mm -hmm. they make the big differences. Absolutely, we use all of our machines in production. Um, so our dream site plants, it's interesting to walk through and see all the double columns, all the big horizontals and things like that, and then two years later you find new iterations to our current products. And it's because, to your point, it's feedback that they got from watching these machines in production for a couple of years. Um, our sludgeless tank, uh, now on a lot of our horizontals, you can order the sludgeless tank. And the way they move the coolant through the tank and all the corners are rounded. And there's just some really neat features on how this thing was designed that doesn't allow cast iron stuff to sit in corners and build up that becomes maintenance problems. So... Um, it's, it's getting that feedback from the people that are driving these things every day that really makes a difference on what your next generation of products is going to look like. Exactly. And you get that, you get that from the people who are using it, the customers. And yeah. it's, it's how a lot of standard products get designed as well is you, you make something special and you're like, oh, you know, that request, they were onto something there. Right. It, it's, it's good feedback they were giving us. And yeah, yeah that's, ex that's exactly how you end up there. Yep. Yeah. You guys going to be at IMTS this year? Yeah, I'm super excited. We'll be, right. in the, we'll be in the same spot in the West Hall. What are you forecasting? You think it's going to be big? Yeah, I, I, I'm not necessarily, you know, I have a physics degree, but I'm not necessarily one for numbers. I, I go by the feel, and I tell you what, I'm really excited about it. I Just getting out there, the contrast of what COVID has brought of, you know, working from home and being uh, removed from, you know, uh, our colleagues and coworkers on a regular basis when I do get out I I, I see a, a need and a desire to get back out and engage and I I think it's going to be big this is just my prediction regardless of what anyone says I think it's going to be huge attendance um, as long as nothing unforeseen comes about I I'm really excited about it I think it's going to be huge we're all in as well. We've got 16 machines going. Uh, I know we're going to have a lot of your nice. products on a lot of them. So uh, we're, we're all in and looking for a big show. So.
Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. 16 machines. It's always. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm always so impressed by what you do. It's there. always a big production, but it's, uh, you know, to your point, this is one of the last industries um, that I think where all the sales, all the service, all the support, we're still very relational. You know, we all have close relationships to our customers, and I think that's such a big thing. And, you know, being locked down, we did the virtual IMTS two years ago. Uh, I think it's great that everybody's going to get back out and, and – uh, it's like a like a family reunion. Sometimes you go to IMTS, you see everybody that you know in the industry. You see customers that you deal with, you know, here and there, but you don't see every day. And it's a great opportunity to see everybody in one spot. So I agree. We're looking I remember forward when to I it. saw you at uh, Gossiger Fest, yeah, uh, last fall, and I, that was one of my first events, kind of getting back out there since the pandemic. And right. I feel like I was just walking around everywhere, just a huge smile on my face. And just, just seeing people. I mean, give me, give me a few more events, and it'll start to sometimes yeah. feel back. burnout. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I remember that event. Yeah. I was walking around, just big smiles, like, "Hey, Wade, how's it going?" It that really awkward fun. when you walk up to somebody. Do you do you fist bump? Do you shake hands? Do you not do anything? But yeah. I, I think we're kind of over some of that now. So I sure very hope good. So. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's great having you here. I appreciate you taking the time joining us. Um, for anybody that wants to learn more about Shunk or your products, what's the best way to go about finding you? Shunk.com or uh, on YouTube, Shunk USA. Um, those are two great ways to find us. Or uh, come, by our, come by our facility in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's Anytime. a beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And thank you for joining us. If you have any thoughts, ideas, or questions for future episodes, please reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn or reach out to me at Akuma. Till next time, we'll see you then. <laughs>